start recording now. Um, I need to tell, tell you that in case somebody has some um, problem with it, as we also plan to publish that later on, on YouTube. Um, second thing what I want to mention technically is that you have the chance to download a handout. Uh, you see uh, this surface, go to web, webinar control panel, and there you have also a point which you can choose handouts. We uploaded poster. On bike sharing, uh, which we, uh, the GIZ Sino German Corporation on Low Carbon Transport, um, elaborated and would like to share with you. It's on uh, bike sharing in China. So that's just a little bit a side handout. And uh, third technical hint is like uh, after this webinar, when we will uh, finish the webinar, you will be uh, relinked or further linked to a survey. We prepared some questions and we would really, really be happy if you find afterwards maybe one, two minutes to attend that survey and um, give us your opinions. It's a multiple choice survey. And if you don't have the time for that, then uh, you will uh, have another chance to attend that survey um, with the follow up email, which you will automatically receive around uh, one hour after today's uh, webinar. So I think um, that's so far for the technical issues and uh, we could go further, I would say, um, to the agenda. So let me again uh, welcome you uh, today to our uh, webinar on urban cycling. I'm very happy uh, you all uh, are here now. This webinar actually is uh, organized by the uh, GIZ Sector Network TourVas. It's uh, German actually, Transport Umwelt Energie Wasser, which means transport, en environment, um, energy and water. It's a sectoral network of GIZ and we organize uh, this webinar in cooperation with SUTP, the Sustainable Urban Transport a project and uh, CLCT, the uh, German Corporation on Low Carbon Transport Project. You will also, in this follow up email, receive the links to these uh, three projects and you can follow up on that and uh, get in touch with us. So, uh, for today's uh, webinar, uh, we have actually two uh, speakers. It's Mr. Liu Dai Zong from uh, WRI, and he will talk on bike. Make cities thrive again, and Pablo Celes from the municipality of Aarhus, and he will give us an input on the rise of a cycling city. And afterwards, uh, each 20 minutes, we will have around half hour for question and answers. And let me just uh, shortly give you an introduction, uh, Mr. Liu Dai. Actually, here is he's here with us in Beijing now. He's the director of China Sustainable Cities Program, and he's also the director of China Transport Program of the World Resources Institute (WRI). And he's responsible for urban redevelopment, transportation (TUD), but also urban planning and urban design projects in China and abroad. And he was leading on the Transit Metropolis project and also work on several projects in China and abroad on road safety, low emission zones. And prior to his work at WRI, he worked for 10 years for the China Sustainable Transportation Center, CSTC, of the Energy Foundation as a senior program associate. And he was also working for three years for CPG consultancy company in Singapore as a transport project manager. He's also the member of the expert Committee Beijing Municipal, Municipal Commission of Transport. And he's also a member of Urban Big Data Committee of the Chinese Society for Urban Studies. Furthermore, he is also the founder of a very successful uh, public uh, WeChat account, Sustainable City, which currently has uh, more than 40,000 followers. And we would like to invite you to join that uh, too. We have then Mr. Pablo Celes. Um, he is located in Aarhus. Uh, currently, thanks again also to attending Pablo. Pablo Celes is currently employed in the municipality of Aarhus, the city road division, where he works with traffic plans and traffic analysis, especially with the purpose of reducing accidents and insecurities caused by traffic. Pablo has been responsible for the making and implementation of a cycling action plan for the municipality of Aarhus. And uh, by that work, 
that has resulted in 19% increase in the cycling use last four years in Aarhus. Pablo Celis is also a very recognized author of several guidelines and handbooks uh, on how to implement cycling measures in Denmark. And he recently published uh, the Danish Cyclopedia, how to make cycling infrastructure in Denmark based on more than 100 years of practical experience. And actually, as far as I know, this uh, cyclopedia is currently in translation as it's a 400 pager. And I hope later on Pablo can also uh, say something about that. And um, I, I hope we all can learn from that. And yeah, I, I thought about to make uh, also a little bit uh, content introduction uh, to the topic to prepare for by Zong and uh, Pablo. But I uh, wanted to keep it quite short, so I just prepared that one slide as we all are on the same track, I guess. Of course, uh, regarding transportation, uh, nowadays we are facing in our cities uh, congestion, congested uh, uh, cities. Uh, this needs uh, leads also to noise and stress, so in generally we can say this reduces our life quality in the cities significantly, car orientation in the cities. Uh, transportation is also a major source of air pollution and uh, cities in China um, transport sector accounts partly in some cities for more than 30 percent of particulate matter emissions and also when we are talking about threats of global warming in China here where we are located the transport sector accounts for around 10 to 12 percent total CO2 emissions and in some cities like Beijing, uh, even more around 26% of the total CO2 emissions. So what I would just want to mention is really that regarding transportation and the future of transport, we completely need to rethink uh, what we did before. And I think cycling in slow mode transportation, non-motorized transport, that's really one key to make our cities more livable more sustainable and to increase the life quality and also I think when we understand that from an economical perspective and the cities today in the globalized world are competing with each other to attract the most innovative people then I think it's ultimately the question about life quality and by that I just want to give uh, directly um, hand over to uh, Leo Daizong who will answer a little bit this kind of question on how to make uh, the cities better and uh, future proof and I just give the stage to you Daizong, thanks for being with us and uh, yeah let's all have a good discussion here. Uh, okay thank you. Hi everyone, uh, this is Daizong from WRI. Uh, I'm very honored to can present here to talking about some things related to the bike sharing uh, in the cities. So today topics uh, is called Bikes My Cities uh, Thrive Again and also all the presentation is uh, prepared by my assistant uh, Ying Jia Zhong from the UN Habitat. So uh, uh, I think most of people uh, should already know from the newspaper or any uh, uh, media channel that China really uh, 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 during some uh, uh, transportation revolution on the, the new the back the dockless back sharing systems, so uh, we want to uh, 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 do some more research on why this is happened and uh, what the challenges the back sharing meets uh, during the city's revolution. Uh, this 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 is what my uh, uh, organization uh, brief. We are kind of NGO and uh, our headquarters is based in the Washington DC and we have uh, 700 stars globally. Uh, the first one, uh, I want to show you a book. This book's name is uh, the, the Urban the RX. That means what make urban district certain. So today's uh, point point, the name of today's point point actually coming from this book. Uh, somebody may be thinking this book is kind of an urban planning book, but actually this is a big data book. Uh, uh, it's kind of a research team from the US. The analysis of almost 50 uh, city central areas of the US. They want to find the principle or rulers, what kind of a factor or key issues that 
uh, makes uh, the U.S. urban district uh, district uh, through. So uh, the summary are uh, uh, totally the twelve principles. And the number six is multiple urban transportation modes is one key factor to promote the cities that can be uh, through. So that means if you only uh, too much rely on the car or, or, or this cannot make the city always uh, uh, successful. So uh, the key issue is you need to provide more uh, 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 means, transportation models to, 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 to citizens, including the public transportation, the bicycle, the walking, and other modes. So as you have more uh, transportation modes and means in the city, that can make the city more better, more successful. So this is uh, the, 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 the core the, the, goal, uh, the concept coming from today's presentation. In the first part, we want to talk about some background about the bike sharing system with the cities. And you can understand why the bike sharing system suddenly happened in China and so uh, quickly, rapidly. Uh, first one is uh, a video. Uh, this is uh, taken in the city of Amsterdam. You can find a city street. It's a very normal street in the peak hours. You can find a lot of people use the bicycles. Sure you can find. Use a bicycle along the street. It's a it's a peak hour in the morning in uh, Amsterdam, and you can find there yeah, are very limited the car also can use the street. But the, the bicycle is king of the street. It dominates most of the space and the right of the street use. So. First, the priority for this street is a very bicycle bike friendly. And the, the secondly, uh, when we promote the, the bicycle in the city, some people said the bicycle is quite difficult to handle the different the weather conditions. So this uh, picture is, uh, is taken from the Copenhagen. During our very uh, cold the winter, the people also like to use the bicycles more than the cars. So th this is another, the, uh, the, the situations that we can find from the, the a lot of cities. So the world class bicycle city means even the weather is not friendly to the bike. People still prefer use a bike. So how these things happen? You can find some uh, very details in Copenhagen. This is a lot of uh, bikes infrastructure facilities. It's a very uh, bike friendly or bike priority at first. You can find the, the left one, the people use a bike stopped at a junction. They can easily find something to stop. They don't need to, 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 to take off from the bike. And in the middle picture, you can find uh, the light. The traffic light is actually designed by the bike speed. So if you can follow the green wave, that means you, you, you don't need to stop at the next junctions. And in Copenhagen, in some uh, subway, you can find some uh, uh, assistance uh, uh, facilities for you to, to 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 use a bicycle crossing the bridge or crossing the, the tunnel and also have a, a lot of free air. So uh, you can find a lot of very bicycle uh, friendly facilities. This kind of facilities can encourage people to use a bicycle even, even in a very bad weather conditions. Another one uh, 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 another issue is uh, bicycles and parking facilities. This is also uh, take the picture from the, the, the Netherlands. You can find in the uh, 2009, most of the city infrastructure uh, are, uh, are provided to the car users. But after this, uh, the almost nine years, you can find the people, the, the city totally change the thinking about how to use uh, the infrastructure, use the space where. So they provide more, the, the quest, it's the same space. They, they provide more space for the for the parking or for the bicycle instead of uh, for cars. And another one example is is uh, coming from the Marmo of Sweden. They even build a, a, a apartment building. It's a very uh, uh, bicycle friendly. You can uh, uh, start from your door of the your home to use a bicycle and to the work door to door the bicycle. Uh, uh, travel and you, you can find there a lot of design is quite friendly to the bicycle user. So, so this apart, apartment building is really designed for the people who use the bicycles. 
And another one is uh, coming from the US. This is a New York City's bicycles network. How you can find how the New York expanding the, the bicycle network from the 1996 to the 2016. So even a country like US, they are they are have a very strong the car culture, but they are still thinking about how to move from the car to the more green transportation uh, modes for the city. Why they do this thing? Because all the city understand one thing: only multiple multimodal transportation means can help the city successful. So this is why even US they don't want the city only rely on the cars. You still want to move the bicycles and the, the public transportation facilities. And another video is a queue in London. You can find how many people use uh, the bicycle even in London. It's a very long queue, you know, very uh, typical peak hours in uh, a bridge of the London. So it's very popular. I just want to show you, it's very popular to use a bike in London. You, everyone in London have a lot of raining days and it's very cold during the winter. But still people prefer to use the bicycles. So why does this happen? And we are also talking about a yeah, very good discussion in the UK. Uh, the left picture show you uh, the, the green infrastructure compare between the UK and the, the Netherlands and the, the Denmark. You can find the UK really have very low the, 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 the green uh, the green transportation infrastructure, but UK have another plan. If they want to improve the bicycles, uh, the, the facilities level to the Danish level, they can save in 17 billion in the next 20 years from the NHS, from the hospital, the insurance. So this is why uh, when UK investment into the cycling system, this also means they are on the money. They are, they are still uh, uh, have a, uh, receive a lot of benefits from this kind of investing. And this is another uh, quite interesting video show you use the same space, how activity the bicycle users compare with the car users. So during the same one hour, uh, the bike dock, you can find they have a two, more than 200 people use the bicycles, but only 11 cars be moved. So it's a quite similar aerial space, but that means the bicycle can create more uh, trips, means you can catch more people use your business if you have a shop very close to the bicycle uh, 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 station. So this also compared to Copenhagen and uh, to, the Cleveland. You can find in the different cities, uh, uh, Copenhagen more prefer the, the bicycles. So they have more business, small business the centers compared with uh, the US countries. So the so people use the cars means less the business the areas. If the people use the bicycle more, so they have more of the business to, to the business areas, so even good for the local economy. So, so all these things show to you that the bicycle really help city more successful from the long-term views. And now I can show you some history of uh, the material big, big into the today's topic about the mixture systems. The mixture system is uh, actually start first one is start from the 1968. 19th, And you can find the different generation of uh, the bike sharing systems during the last 30 years, mainly during the last 10 years, how the bike sharing system is expanding globally. Actually, the modern bike sharing system is start from the Paris in the, uh, 2007. And this kind of model is called, it's a GPS and the apps based the bike sharing system is very quickly uh, expand to other countries. And the latest revolution of uh, back sharing systems is uh, happening in China. It's a kind of uh, dockless uh, back sharing systems, mobile or offer. So you can find that China have a really a lot of the cities that have uh, back sharing systems with uh, very big skills. Okay, so now we can go to the, the, the second part of today's topic. Is, uh, we are is talking about the rest of the bike sharing in China. What's the opportunity and what's the challenges we met and how we can handle these situations. Uh, the first one, uh, 
uh, I want to show you some uh, the key China bike sharing's uh, data. For example, it, it's quite interesting. Uh, during the last 10 years, from the 2006 to the 2016, in this 10 years, China government actually subsidized all the bike sharing systems. And in 10 years, they only get a uh, bike sharing system population the nationally have uh, 800,000 bike sharing the number of the bicycles but the, but the interesting thing is when more bike this is a marketing is a private sector come to this market they only use one and a half years currently they have uh, 8 million the bikes on under the uh, operation so that means they use one year have uh, 10 times compared with the government use uh, 10 years the, 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 the size of the whole uh, the systems. So this is quite interesting in China that the private, uh, private sector is really the, the, the very strong the, the, the power to, to expanding the bike sharing systems. And another one is very interesting is how fast that the mobile bike, the bike sharing system uh, uh, like a mobile bike expanding. So this is a figure how the daily the beers can uh, raise to the 20 millions per day. Uh, in China, you, you can find in DD, they use uh, almost uh, the, the, uh, 31 months to reach, uh, 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 no, 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 uh, 15 months to reach, that's uh, 200, uh, uh, 20 million, 20 million beers per day. But more bikes only use uh, 11 months. And uh, you can see the Alibaba use uh, even longer, the, the Taobao in the mid time so it that's that means the people really all the, the people in china really like the bike sharing system otherwise it cannot have so many the orders per day so the issue is the more bike mode is really can achieve that the people's uh, the use the demand from the, the urban transportation side and another video okay my god i need to show another video okay but it's not work. Another video you can, uh, it's also provided by the mobile company. It's just the one bicycles can continue to be used for uh, 360, almost one years. And uh, they can continue to be used by uh, almost uh, close to the 2000 different peoples and undertake uh, 2000 the readerships. And the distance is almost 400 and 800 kilometers. It's a one bike without any trouble, without any uh, the maintenance. They can continue to use. So it's quite good quality. And then you can find this is a bike sharing scheme in the whole China. So they almost have 174 cities have such kind of a bike sharing scheme. And the average year cost is uh, forty-four dollars. It includes the deposit and uh, how you pay for the bike sharing systems. And this our most of the areas of China. And uh, okay, so this also has some data coming from the bike sharing with papers. That's before and after the, back, the new generations of bike sharing happened. Before, uh, in the typical city like Beijing, only five point five percent of the trips is undertaken by the bikes. But after the bike sharing season happened, it's almost a double. Just in one year, the bike share uh, are doubled to the 11.6%. So it's quite popular now in, in China. And another one is a very, very interesting uh, 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 question. Uh, interesting thing is uh, bicycle, the bike sharing is really happened to connect or integrate with other modes like the bus or metro systems. So this figure can show to you 81% 80, of the bike sharing trips is around the bus stations areas. That means uh, within the 200 meters around the bus stops. And in Shanghai, that number can increase to the 90%. So that means it really means the people use a bike to connect with the bus or with the metro systems. And so another data can can show you. Uh, this is uh, we uh, use a mobile data in Shenzhen, and we also uh, integrate with uh, the mobile company. Also integrate with the bus uh, informations. 
So the yellow, uh, in the left picture, you can find the yellow areas. Yellow areas means that the bus stops cannot cover, bus service cannot cover coverage these areas. So this is a uh, empty areas for the bus services. And in the middle, this is a mobile, how they uh, put the, their the bicycles on the street. And after this uh, overlap, you can find most of uh, areas that the bus service is empty. It can be used by the bicycles to 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 fill the out. So this means the the bicycles really works with the uh, 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 bus, the public transportation together to form a, a multimodal uh, urban transportation mode. And another one is very interesting is the key how we can make a success for the bike sharing systems. Even we are talking about the the, the station based bike sharing system. This is from the U.S. The analysis of uh, the 30 cities of the U.S. Uh, the station based bike sharing systems. So from the uh, left uh, picture, you can find you have a high density of the st stops, and you can have better the, uh, the economic performance of the bike sharing systems. For example. The best one uh, is from the Paris, I think. Huh? So they have a reader per, per bike is a five five times per, per, per bike per day, and they have a, a highest the, the den density for the stations areas. And the the, the, NAS, the NATO report also analyzes several cities in U.S. So they give a recommendation that it's better each uh, 1,000 feet, uh, you should uh, have a station for the bike, and each square mile, you should have uh, uh, 28 bike stations. So this can have the bicycle uh, system, the bike sharing system more successful, more better the economic performance. And, uh, okay, so uh, we, we're talking a, a lot of things that the bike sharing system really changed the form of uh, China's uh, cities, uh, uh, people's travel behaviors, but we still, because it's a new thing for the city, so we still face a lot of challenges. You may also see from newspaper or from other media channels. Uh, so the big question is uh, parking issues. You can find this from this picture. They have a, a we call it a, a tom for the bike sharing. Uh, so, uh, because they, uh, uh, they have so many challenges from the bike sharing system, so China uh, government really thinking to publish some policy or guidelines to make a city a uh, better governance or better management or handle these uh, bike sharing systems. So, currently we have uh, a Ministry of Transportation and another 20 cities really publish the guidelines for the bike sharing systems. And the, the main focus of the government is a there's a six topic list here. The first one is the deposit management. How you um, make the, the because people use a bike need a deposit. So how 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 to management the, the deposit is one a focus from this kind of a policy paper. Another one is big challenges of parking management issues. The third one is a data regulation because they have so many uh, bike sharing companies. For example, in Beijing, we have uh, still have a uh, twelve. Even some company bankrupt, but we still have a uh, twelve bike sharing companies uh, in Beijing. So how make the data regulation? Government can easily to have to access the data is uh, another issue. And the number four is uh, do we need to, to control the quantity or the ownership, the the, the fleet size for the bike sharing companies? So how many bikes per company per city? Do we need to control the, the cap, to, to set up a cap is another issue. And then the number five, the, the, the focus is a technical requirement. That means, uh, uh, do you need to set up the, the, the GPS uh, uh, on the bikes or do you need some uh, the geo fence technologies? So they also need to be identified by this kind of policy paper. The last one is the government, the institutional issues. So we, which department of the local government to in charge of what kind of uh, measurement roles for the bike sharing systems. So uh, most of uh, a, a, a policy paper published in China is focused on this sixth topic. And uh, uh, in Jiazheng do some analysis about these 20 cities of the policy. 
So you can find the data access. Uh, they have a, a, almost a nine cities uh, guidelines uh, uh, identify how the government uh, access the platform or what kind of data format. And for the deposit, most of cities thinking deposit should be, be regulated and they should be uh, 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 it's uh, encouraged that most of the, the private sector, uh, private company should be give a free deposit to the users and still have some other different the deposit management policy from the different cities. And for insurance for the people safe, and most of the city is thinking the bike sharing system should be provide the, the free insurance to the users. It's uh, quite required. And uh, for a very sensitive topic about the quantity control, uh, most of the city is thinking the private sector and the public sector should be discussion a, a, a cap for overall the, the number of the bike, bikes can be shared in the city. But how we identify this uh, uh, very specific data the number is quite difficult. So they are just to see, set up the ruler, but didn't find the methodology how to make this uh, quantity, the numbers happen. And uh, most of uh, Chinese cities uh, 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 policy papers mentioned the parking. Parking is a very important part of uh, policy. So uh, some city want, want to encourage the private sector to use a smart parking management system, use a GEO fans. So where the people can parking uh, can be used by the GEO fans from the apps and can encourage or forbidden people parking someplace or, or or encourage them to do this one. So uh, this is a kind of a very briefly introduction about the 20 Chinese cities uh, uh, policy on uh, bike-sharing system. And we also find that the Seattle from the US also have a very good bike-share permit requirement policy. So we also do some uh, analysis about the Seattle's uh, bike-sharing permit requirements. Uh, the first, uh, very, quite different between the Seattle and the uh, China cities is a Seattle very focused on the safety indicator, but China are, are, are more focused on the bike. The scrap. They sit up three years or four years, the bike needs a scrapping. But US cities are more focused on safety, like the, the distance for the bar, for the parking, or how, how you, maybe the 10 meters or 20 meters you needed the, the, the bicycle totally stopped. So, so they use this kind of safety indicator as a requirement for the safety issues. But, so this is one uh, different thing between the US cities and the China cities. Another one, uh, the Seattle also give a very detailed uh, information about the parking management. They are not only uh, give, uh, give some positive uh, requirement for the parking, also some negative requirement for the parkings. And uh, this, they also talking about if one bike are parking there for continuous seven days. They have to be moved, removed by the city or the, by the company. So you cannot always take in the, the space of the street more than seven days. And so, so they even have a lot of uh, joints to show where it can uh, can parking, where it cannot parking. So compared with China, uh, Seattle give more details, uh, specification about the parking management. And the third one is the operation. And it's quite interesting in Seattle. They want all the private sector company pay $80 per bicycles as a deposit to for the city management. So, but they also set a cap of for the $10,000 overall. So this means if government, city government, find that you are not full or obey the ruler or you are broken the ruler, they can directly find you for this deposit. So they use this one to, to, to management the bike operation. And the Seattle also thinking they want to, they are not control the number of overall bicycles, but they control the, the, the density of the bicycles per square kilometers. So they only allow 130 bicycles per square kilometers in the Seattle cities. And another thing, they are not control the quantity of uh, uh, overall bicycles uh, the numbers they are control the speed how the new bicycle put on the street for the for the uh, for the private sector for the bike sharing company during the first uh, month's operation they only can have no more than 500 new operated bicycle on the street and the second month 
they allowed 1,000. And the third month, they allowed 2,000. So they control the speed, means they can track in the performance given this kind of policies. But overall, how many bicycles? They, I don't think it, even they have to have an idea how many they need. Because it's quite new, new uh, systems. And the, the people's behavior are also very new. So nobody knows what's the limit. They have a song in, 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 in the very famous called the Nine Million Bicycles in Beijing, right? So, so that means it's quite a lot bicycle can, can happen. And the, uh, another one in Seattle is very interesting. Is they also set up a format called API for all the companies. They have a full bike sharing company operated in Seattle. So they give all these company a format for as an API. So all these companies need to give a report to the city government based on this kind of data format and to real time to reporting the bicycle sharing systems. So you can find they, they have GPS, they have uh, uh, the name, the, the, the name, the, 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 the status running or stop, uh, what the, the OD strip, OD trips and number of the bicycles, blah, 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 information here. So the, this is actually a give very clearly a guidance to the companies that's what kind of the data the government needed and what's the requirements. So it's quite good. So we do some uh, analysis by the uh, in Jiazheng to compare the Seattle and the Shanghai. What's um, they do some uh, the the words the analysis. So you can find Seattle very focused on the permitted uh, some uh, indicators, but Shanghai are more focused on uh, some measurement of uh, parking and uh, some information release issues. So it's kind of a data, the the big the, the words analysis. And another one we compare with the San Francisco's uh, the bike sharing permit with the Beijing. So I, I, I hopefully hopefully our, our uh, audience can find some uh, interesting words here. Okay. So that's our last the point. I, I hope we can discuss more details if you have interest. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, actually, uh, all of you, I want just shortly turn on the, the, the webcam here. That's on. Because I think usually um, uh, we have uh, the webcam on, of course, so you can see the speaker. And I just want to let you know that um, we decided not to turn the webcam on as also like with the videos you uh, saw that in China, sometimes we face some little issues with the internet speed. So um, I will continue by um, giving the uh, next session. Let me just here in the system and over the presentation. Yeah, to Mr. Pablo Celes. Pablo, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you quickly. So uh, I think. Pablo, you should be the presenter now. Um, again, for the uh, participants joined us later, Pablo is uh, located in the city of Aarhus. Um, you have a slow internet connection. Would you? Yes, <laughs> that's the thing what I was talking about. Um, Pablo Celes is located in the city of Aarhus and uh, just again, he's working in the municipality and he is a very, very uh, well-recognized uh, expert for cycling and Pablo I would just say we are looking very much forward to your presentation and uh, your yeah, stage is yours okay thank you thank you so much and thank you uh, Mr. Liu for your great presentation we're just uh, in Aarhus uh, trying to implement the uh, Mobike so uh, a lot of your, uh, your, your facts and uh, notes are very useful for us so uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I just want to uh, show you a brief map of the world just so you can see where we are. Uh, is everything good? Is the sound good and the uh, picture good for you? Perfect, perfect. Perfect, great. So, uh, I am from the little kingdom of Denmark that is placed uh, right here. It's, uh, it's a country with only uh, six million inhabitants. And um, some of you maybe know the uh, capital of uh, Denmark, Copenhagen, which is uh, situated right there. And the city of Aarhus is a little tiny city with uh, around 300,000 inhabitants. And it's actually a very, very beautiful city. It's a small city compared to cities in uh, China. And it's uh, beautifully uh, located between the sea and the forest. 
And we are a very young city. Uh, almost 45,000 of our inhabitants are students. So we have a very nice uh, atmosphere in the city uh, with people sitting out and drinking. And we are also a city in growth. Uh, every year we uh, we grow with around 1 or 2%. Uh, so it's a very livable city. Uh, this is a picture of me riding with my uh, daughter on a bicycle in the city and this is really a picture of what uh, drives me uh, as a professional and as a person, uh, human being. This is for me uh, the great example of a life-size city where you're able to ride your bicycle with your kids without wearing a helmet and just enjoying life. So this is really what I would like to uh, share with other cities and try to implement with other cities uh, around the world. So back to Aarhus. Um, this is a funny picture, actually. It's the first bicycle path ever constructed in Aarhus, and it's from the year 1894. So you can you can uh, imagine we have more than a 100 years of uh, tradition in building bicycle paths. So that's uh, quite incredible. So, but what you should notice here is that there are actually this is a real photo. It, there are actually two women on bicycles on this uh, first bicycle path in uh, Oak. And at this time, this was a very, a very rare uh, site. We actually have a statue of a very famous guy in uh, Aarhus who stated in the year 1894 that women on bicycles are a disgrace to society. And I laugh at this because we actually have a statue of this guy in the city of Cyprus uh, in Aarhus. But the thing is, uh, today, more than 100 years after, this is the exact same bicycle path. There are bicycles everywhere and there are women on bicycles everywhere. And actually in Aarhus, we have more women riding bicycles than men. We have 54% of all cyclists being women. So that's why we say we're not the biggest bicycle city of the world, but we are the most beautiful bicycle city of the world. So that was the short introduction of uh, all this. But as Mr. Liu told you, looking at Denmark, uh, we have cyclists everywhere. We bike to everything. We bike when it rains, uh, we bike when it snows. Uh, all our kids, or most of them, ride their bikes when they go to school, almost 50%. Uh, every day. Even our newly elected politicians ride their bicycles when going to parliament. And this is not only because they're newly elected, they actually do this every day in Copenhagen. This is also a funny picture from uh, Copenhagen uh, from the late 50s. There are bicycles everywhere. Denmark has always been a cycling nation. But if you take this same exact picture, uh, the same exact place, and turn the time 70 years ahead for today, the picture looks like this. And this is really what's worrying us because this could be a picture from any other bigger city in Europe or in the world. We today have cars everywhere. We once were a proud cycling nation, but it's just been going down and down and down since the late 50s. And this is a picture of the the uh, evolution of the bicycle index in Denmark. And you can see it's just been going down also the last 20 years. And that's why we in Denmark, in the nation of uh, cycling, are uh, promoting cycling again. And that's why I work with cycling promotion in the city of Aarhus. This is a picture from uh, Aarhus, some of our bicycle path. We have some very, very beautiful bicycle infrastructure. And uh, we actually, uh, in the city, in the municipality of Aarhus, we have 675 kilometers of bicycle paths, protected bicycle paths. Just so you can compare, we have 1,250 kilometers of road. So we actually have bicycle infrastructure almost everywhere. So this is not the reason why we are having a lack of people using their bicycles. Uh, in Aarhus, we have 25% of all trips uh, to work are made by bike. Um, that's quite high when you compare with uh, other cities in the world. But nevertheless, if we look at Odense, uh, Odense the, the home place of Hans Christian Andersen, is the third largest city in Denmark. They have 30% of all trips are made by bike. And if we look at our capital, Copenhagen, 45% of all trips in Copenhagen are made by bike. 
And why is it that the second largest city in Denmark only has 25%? Well, actually, Aarhus is a very bad cycling city. And there are three, reason, three main reasons for this. And the first reason, and the most important reason, is that we have hills in uh, Aarhus. Um, traveling from the inner city and six kilometers out of the city, you have to elevate yourself 100 meters uh, to get out of the city. In Copenhagen and in Odense, the cities are very small and they're flat as pancakes. And this is really a problem in you know, who's getting people to ride bikes and elevating themselves 100 meters. This is a problem going up and it's also a problem going down. We have a lot of high speed cyclists and a lot of accidents at our intersections. So this is uh, a main reason for that people don't use their bicycles in the city of Aarhus. The next reason is that the municipality actually is a very big municipality. We have a lot of cities uh, situated in distances of 20, 10, 15 kilometers away from the inner city. And this is really a problem because in Denmark we say the bicycle can be used within a radius of five, five or six kilometers. Everything above this, people will start taking the bus or taking their car or their car number two. In the inner city of Aarhus, we have a lot of these uh, everyday cyclists like the uh, woman on the picture. Uh, people who just use their bikes the same way as they put on their shoes in the morning. They get off uh, and ride their bike to school or to the university or to the work. And we have a lot of cyclists in the inner city. The real big problem is getting people from the other small cities to ride their bike into the uh, inner city on these uh, 20 kilometer rides. What we're seeing right now is actually an increase of these super commuters. Uh, you can see a picture of this guy dressed up for using his bicycle. He, he dresses up in the morning, rides 20 kilometer. When he comes to work, he takes a shower, changes clothes and go to work. And the same when he goes back. Uh, and we're seeing an increase of these type of super cyclists, uh, you know, who's also because of the uh, uh, popular e-bikes that are uh, coming to, to, to Denmark. So, and the other big problem is uh, that all of our bicycle infrastructure is situated along the main roads. And the thing is, you mix car traffic, bus traffic, lorry traffic, and bicycle traffic on the same uh, uh, roads and the problem you have is problems with congestion, uh, pollution and traffic safety and this keeps people away from using their bikes because they don't feel safe using the bicycle. So those are the three main problems that we've had in uh, Aarhus uh, that are very unique for the city. We don't have many bigger cities in Denmark with hills and with these problems that we have in, in Aarhus. So uh, in the year 2009, the uh, city council gave us uh, a little present, uh, around 10 million euros, to see if we could turn the tides from going from an evolution where people weren't stopping using their bikes to increase the uh, use of the bicycle. And my, really, my main idea was, well, we have the bicycle infrastructure needed. We have around 700 kilometers of bicycle paths. So if I have to build new bicycle paths, I will do it in between the main roads, not alongside the main roads, and build super cycle highways so you can get fast from the uh, rural cities to the uh, inner city of Aarhus. So in 2010, I built the uh, first super cycle highway uh, placed in between the uh, main roads. And the big advantage of putting this infrastructure in between the main roads is that you have a lot of space and you can use the nature. This is uh, from the uh, supercycle highway and you can see here's a lot of space for you to ride fast, to ride slow, or to even ride with your kids or your wife on a Sunday afternoon and really enjoy uh, the nature. And this is uh, alongside a river and you can see this is as so recreational that you can ride on the water. <laughs> and this is just to illustrate, this was uh, uh, a day where, where we had some very uh, hard rain and the, uh, the, the sea flooded. But normally it's dry, perfectly dry, and there's lighting and you can go uh, in your own pace and get juvenilized on this uh, bicycle route. And the idea of the bicycle super commuter highways is actually to use uh, the tunnels that we have and to cross all other traffic out of level. So if we have 
tunnels, we use them. If we don't have them, we build them. And if we cannot build tunnels, we build beautiful, nice bridges so people can cross fast and safe, safely where we have uh, traffic uh, other places. The thing is, uh, this attracts people within the municipality, uh, these super commuter highways. We have a lot of people riding their car 50, 100 kilometers every day coming from other cities in Denmark to work in Aarhus. And they say, well, the bicycle is not an option for me because they need their car. They have to ride 100 kilometers every day. And I wanted to prove them wrong. So I made a demonstration project. Here we have the uh, bicycle uh, super highway. Uh, the green line represents the highway coming into Aarhus. And right at this spot, I built the first bike and park terminal in Denmark. The thing is, people come in their cars, they come to the inner city and they get stuck in, in traffic. They use around 45 minutes uh, distancing, distancing the last eight kilometers into the inner city. So I wanted to give them an, an alternative. So I built this park and bike terminal where you for free can park your car and then you can rent a box. Uh, the box actually is free. And in this box, you can have your own bicycle uh, securely locked and stowed away. So when you get in in the morning, you park your car, you take your own bicycle alongside our super commuter highway. And instead of being stuck in traffic uh, for 45 minutes, you can enjoy your ride. It takes around 20 minutes on your bicycles and you get the everyday exercise. And this is of course, a thing you can use when it's uh, good weather or when you really feel like it. If it's pouring down with rain or it's snowing, you can of, of course just take your car. But this has actually been um, an eye-opener for many because they suddenly start thinking that the, the car can be used in combination with the bicycle. And that's quite interesting. We also made some uh, facilities for the runners and so you can stretch out after your uh, bicycle ride and we also made a playground for the small kids uh, in the area we have a lot of kindergartens and the thing is uh, in one of the boxes I put these uh, balance bikes uh, for use for the uh, kindergartens and in the other box there are some bicycle helmets and some remedies and I gave the kindergartens uh, cargo bikes electrical cargo bikes so the idea is that one teacher can take four kids to this facility and train around with the kids on these balance bikes in the playground or around the, the lake uh, on our super commuter highway. And this has been really a great uh, success for the uh, project that we have had this uh, um, it's been a really great story. Our main uh, problem is, of course, when we build uh, super commuter highways in the uh, open widths, it's no problem because we have a lot of space. But what do you do when you want to have a lot of bicycle traffic in the inner city where you don't have too much space? Um, this is a picture from uh, part of the route of the super commuter highway from before. It's taken in 2007. And as you can see here, we have around 8,000 cyclists every day passing through bi-directional. We have parked cars, we have one uh, way street cars, uh, traffic, we have uh, lorries parked, and we have pedestrians, and it's a total chaos. The thing is, we don't have the space to build bicycle paths when we get to the inner city. Then what do we do? I looked at Germany, I looked at uh, Holland, they have uh, invented the uh, bicycle street. The idea is to turn around the priority on the streets. Instead of cars having priority, you give the priority to cyclists. So the cyclists have priority on bicycle streets, the cars can enter, but they must take care of the cyclists. So I wanted to introduce this uh, in Denmark and I asked the uh, Danish road director if I could do this um, and they say no because it would require a change in the law and I asked our Ministry of Justice can I do this in Denmark introduce the first bicycle street they say no not before you get a recommendation from the Danish road director so I was stuck with the problem that I could not solve so instead of waiting for the, uh, the, the authorities to give me a green light I just did it uh, and we built the first bicycle street in Denmark in 2012. And the idea was actually to build a bi-directional four meter width bicycle track uh, and put bicycle symbols on it. 
And the idea is you can enter as a cyclist with priority and you can enter as a car in one way, but you have to stay behind the cyclists. And this has been uh, working since 2012. And the thing is, people use it in the right way. People understand, the cyclists understand that they have priority on this street and the cars understand that they have to take special care of the cyclists. The result of this is we have almost eliminated the uh, amount of uh, traffic accidents. We have reduced the amount of uh, car traffic uh, around 30%. And the users are really, really happy with this uh, bicycle streets. Uh, this is a picture from uh, the other street uh, I just show you. Uh, we also built this for a bicycle street. And just so you can compare, uh, this is how it looked like before. Now we have another problem, you can see, because by removing all the car traffic, suddenly, uh, also what we did was we widened the pedestrian area. But now people are moving out on the pedestrian area uh, with the restaurants having their coffee, eating their meal. And we have a lot of life in these uh, bicycle streets that we didn't have before. So now one of the main problems are that the pedestrian steps out on the bicycle street instead of the cars. But this is for me uh, a great example on how you can transform a traffic city road to a very livable, very attractive road that also uh, supports the economy of the city. So this has been very interesting for, for the city of Aarhus and for Denmark. We just this summer introduced 11 new bicycle streets. And the most great thing of all is that the Danish road directorate actually uh, last year announced that they had a good idea and that they would uh, implement bicycle streets in Denmark. So now we have an official sign. Uh, this is the official sign for bicycle streets in Denmark. And now it's being implemented in many of the cities in uh, also in Copenhagen, Oberg, Lunds and Aviate. So this has really been a great measure because the idea is with two signs, you can transform the priority of uh, the the, the cyclists uh, in the city, a very cheap and very, very effective measure to uh, accommodate, accom accommodate cyclists. So the other thing we've had uh, an emphasis on in, uh, in, in Aarhus is the cyclists uh, themselves. I normally, we cannot have super commuters if they don't know how to ride a bike. Um, normally I ask the crowd when I show my presentation, I ask them, what is wrong with these four cyclists? Everybody answers, they're not wearing a helmet. But that's not the problem. The problem is they're seated way too low on their bicycles. And why is that a problem? Well, if you're seated too low on your bicycle, you cannot get the, uh, the strength from your legs to the pedal. So that means going uphill is much worse not seated correctly. The other thing is, if you're not seated correctly, you don't have the right balance on your bicycle. And that means if you're in an accident or almost in an accident, you, you cannot maneuver your bicycle because all of your weight is on the back wheel of the bicycle. So one of the things we have had a, a lot of emphasis in, on in, in Aarhus is to um, educate our cyclists. Um, we make these pop-up stands uh, where we uh, stop people on their bicycle and we say, well, I can see your bicycle uh, tire is flat and your chain needs lubrication. Can we do that for you? And people, yeah, of course, they stay in line and uh, to do this service of their bicycle. And in two minutes, we show people how to uh, adjust their bicycle. This is very easy to adjust the height of the, uh, the, the bicycle uh, thing. Um, also, I uh, pumped their bicycle, uh, I adjust it. And the thing is, we use two or three minutes uh, with these guys. Um, and the thing is, people come flying away with a completely new experience on their bicycles. Um, so, can you still hear me? I think there's a problem with the sound. Could you confirm? Pablo, we can hear you. You can, there's, uh, the thing is. Okay. I think, yeah, 
the, there's some little bit lag in the connection, but Pablo, are you still there? Pablo? Okay, I think we have a little bit of problem with the connection here. Pablo, are you back? I can Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. Can we reconnect in two minutes? It's okay. I, I, I you can hear you, Pablo. Can hear me okay so we'll start we'll start again there's a i'm sorry because there's a problem with the internet connection in this office that i am uh, no, so no, if it uh, continues yours, not only in yours don't worry <laughs> oh okay so okay so the thing is i'll, I'll just uh, continue so the thing is people uh, come flying away from this uh, workshop they have their bicycle adjusted uh, we we tell them how important it is to uh, maintain your bicycle because a lot of our accidents actually are caused because people don't duplicate their chain. The chain breaks and runs off and then you cannot brake on your bicycle. Uh, we pump the bicycle to tell them if the bicycle is not pumped, you have problems with punctures. And also you would use a lot of energy in uh, pressing the tires flat uh, going uphill. So this is the reason why we in uh, August have this automated free bicycle pumps and this is uh, really especially for the women because they don't have the strength to pump their bicycles uh, with a normal pump so this has really been great this is a, a funny picture of a, a, an Indian exchange student who had a problem with his uh, back as you can see the, this is one of the most extreme uh, examples I've seen the seat is turned around uh, it was quite funny but we have a lot of people uh, coming with very very uh, common problems with their bicycles that we can help them with to to make a better experience we've also done a lot of campaigns of course uh, promoting the uh, bicycle use and we say we only want to focus uh, on all the good reasons uh, for using your bicycles. I know there's a lot of people saying there are so many bad reasons for using your bicycles, but we've been very, very positive on our communication on the uh, Over Cycling City project. And the one thing uh, that I've done that has really had a very, very big impact was that on all the things I've done, I've put on the sign Aarhus Sykelby, as it says here, that says Aarhus Cycling City. And I've put the municipality logo in gold in everything because I knew this funding of 10 million euros would run out eventually. And if I could not show results, I needed to have some monuments in the city always telling that we want to be a cycling city. So when people see this and see that there's some bad infrastructure for cyclists, they would go and put pressure on the politicians and this has really been proven to being the best uh, measure I've uh, done with the project uh, actually but continuing we've done a lot of campaigns uh, also for the uh, kids or we start at uh, the age of two uh, educating uh, the kids with these uh, balance bikes as, as I, I showed you at the uh, park and bike terminal we have our own bike mascot the uh, cycle fund who uh, goes teaching all the small kids on how to ride their bicycles. Uh, this has been a really great uh, success for the project. The good thing of commuting communicating with kids is that you also communicate with their parents. So eventually the kids are going to say, we want to go on bicycles to our institution. We don't want to sit in the back of your car. So this has really moved uh, a lot of people away from the cars. And this is a thing we've been doing for the last uh, eight years with very great success. We've done a lot of campaigns for the work to bike, uh, bike to work campaigns. Um, we have a lot of companies saying, well, that's great. You want us to uh, ride our bikes uh, to work, but we don't have a facility where we can shower after these 10, 15 kilometers uh, riding our bikes. So I told them, no problem. So I made some mobile bicycle trailers with uh, car trailers with uh, showers. So they we vented these for the uh, companies, so they didn't have an excuse not to run this campaign. And this actually was, I don't know how effective it was, but the, the idea of doing this and the, the, uh, the stories in the, uh, in the papers was actually very good and good for the uh, project. And also Red uh, raised awareness on the necessity of companies 
uh, having facilities for you to change your clothes and to take a bath if you want people to use their bicycles. So we have also had a lot of uh, um, focus on uh, cleaning our roads. Um, I bought a lot of uh, new material, these small tractors who can both clean the bicycle path and spray salt on them. And the idea was to have all the bicycle paths clear from 6 a.m. in the morning to 6 p.m. every day if there's snow. And as you can see on the uh, picture from above, the bicycle path is cleaned before the roads. And this is a very good signal for people using their bikes also in uh, winter time. Um, and it's been a real great measure. So, just to sum up, this is just a few uh, of the projects I've made with this uh, big funding that I got. But the uh, results have been really amazing. Uh, the gray line, gray line below is the uh, bicycle evolution on a national plan in Denmark. And it's really just been constant. It, it had a little hop in uh, 2014, but went down again. What is interesting is in 2010, you can see the bicycle traffic uh, went down with 13%. That's a very, very big uh, decrease in uh, cycling. And the reason is actually that we have six, we had six months of snow covered uh, landscape in Denmark that year. But that was the exact same year that I started prioritizing cleaning of the roads uh, on snow. And as you can see on the evolution on the bicycle traffic in, in Aarhus, it just fell 3%. So the thing is, if you clean the bicycle path, you can have people riding their bicycles every year long. But otherwise than that, you can see the bicycle traffic in Aarhus has just exploded the last uh, four or five years and it's been a humongous uh, success uh, among the citizens of course they love the project these are two citizens getting married uh, and riding away on one of our project bikes this is our alderman she loves the project because there's so many good stories that she can go out with and be uh, be accounted for so for for her this is the most positive promotions that she can get so that has really been great on a political level this is our mayor with the chain around his uh, neck and beside him is the crown prince of Denmark. And when he got twins, he, get, he got a gift from the city of Aarhus and of course it was a bicycle. And on the bicycle it says a gift from the cycling city of Aarhus. So also the mayor and the crown prince of Denmark gets involved in this project and can see all the good things about it. But one thing we've done, of course, is uh, promoting uh, the bicycle use and making good measurements. But the other thing we've done is also putting restrictions on the car traffic. And this is really, really important if you want to get people to use their bicycles. In Aarhus, with the project, I have removed a lot of parking spaces. And the thing is, today it's almost impossible to find free parking in the inner city. And this is one of the things that, that drives people away from the car and into onto the bicycle. Uh, today, it's so difficult that people just park everywhere and where it's illegal. Uh, what I've done to prevent this is that I put bicycle parking instead. So it's impossible for them to park their cars everywhere. This has uh, really worked, worked fine. The other thing we've done in Aarhus is instead of building more uh, cities in the outskirts of uh, Aarhus, we're building the city highs. So we densify the city so people don't have long distances to go. So the obvious choice for them is to live in the city and to step out on their bicycle uh, every day. Now we're building the next super commuter highway. Uh, we're building it alongside with our new light rail, which actually just for one hour ago uh, opened. Um, and while we're building it together with the light rail, I'll come back. The thing is, we have a lot of elevation on this uh, super commuter highway. The light rail cannot take all these elevations. So they build bridges for the light rail. And on these bridges, I've built our super commuter highways. So instead of having a lot of hills, you can go flat from the uh, outskirts of uh, Aarhus into the uh, inner city of Aarhus. We're starting at the uh, train station, of course. This is where people arrive on their train or go by bike to the train. Uh, we have a problem with 
the bicycle parking. We have really bicycles everywhere and a lack of uh, bicycle parking facilities. So we're this year building a bicycle parking house. Uh, it's going to have a space for 2,500 bicycles. We're going to introduce the Japanese uh, automated bicycle parking system. And this is uh, especially for the super commuters coming on uh, expensive bicycles from the outskirts to the inner city so they can have them stored securely. This is going to cost money. The other thing is going to be for free. Uh, the second uh, super commuter highway is actually under construction. And this is uh, a picture of it also from above. And as you can see, it's beautifully located uh, away from all the main roads. And this is really for me, uh, the future infrastructure of uh, cycling in, in Denmark. We're gonna build a covered bicycle path on this um, uh, super commuter highway. And it's not only to give uh, protection from rain and snow, but it's to put uh, solar panels on the rooftop so we can provide the uh, super commuter highway with green energy for lighting and stuff. We're also so building a 300 meter or constructing a 300 meter uh, strawberry field alongside the uh, Velostrada. And this is to attract other people than the super commuters. We want other people to use this also as a recreational place to go uh, in their spare time with their kids, go and uh, take strawberries from the uh, super commuter highways. We also uh, planting trees with apples, uh, putting benches, so you can make this an extortion uh, of the weekend. And in this way, get more value for the money that we invest on these uh, super commuter highways. So I would like to invite you all to come to Aarhus and have a strawberry if you have time. So thank you. Pablo, thank you so much for these uh, insights on the case and uh, on your way of how to make the cities better by uh, giving priority to cyclists. Uh, actually, I want just to mention we are a little bit um, behind the time schedule, but I think uh, there were some scientists mentioning that time is there to be stretched. So I think we will stand by some. Yeah. So actually, um, what I... What I think is that we had now two presentations and Liu De Zong, he showed us that bike sharing and especially in China, the free floating bike sharing, that this is something which is brought up bottom up by companies as business cases. So there are companies, they're bringing these schemes on the road and they start up the revolution. And on the other hand, we have the perspective of Pablo from the municipality point of view in some way a top-down point of view. And I think the interesting thing was to see the different perspectives and approaches because in the end, I think we need both together. We need the market and we need innovators. We need to have um, venture capital and so on to drive this kind of development. But on the other hand, we need, I wouldn't even say punisher, but regulators and steerers. And so I think this is a, was a really, really interesting um, insight from both of your sites on, on bike sharing and on the case of ours. And I just would like to bring in the questions um, of the uh, participants. Um, actually, to all of you again, uh, you can ask questions. You have this little bit, uh, this function to your right side of the panel to ask these questions. So let's start. Dai Zong, there's a question. You have mentioned the use of geofencing technology to regulate bicycle parking. I know that in some Chinese cities there are Mobike or Ofos designated biking areas. Can you please speak more about the discussion behind the construction of dockless parking areas in public spaces? Who has the say in deciding the landscape of dockless bicycle parking? Thank you. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, first of all, I don't think geofencing now is a very mature technology for, for, for measurement. Uh, so a big population of the bike sharing systems. But the good thing is, uh, uh, like mobile or offer, this kind of uh, companies already provide some, uh, 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 how to say, it, more positive or, or, or encourage initiatives. That if the peak people parking the bike, uh, within some areas that be geofenced, you can get some bonus or discount for your usage of the bicycles. 
So they uh, use this kind of a case to make some uh, experiment. And uh, the parking place is really work together with the local city uh, government or department. And they need to discuss um, together to find uh, where the place should be parking and with, where is a place cannot be parked. So, uh, uh, and, you, and uh, as I know, China, some cities are starting to the street design guidelines. So they are now want to add a new chapter in street design guidelines to give more guidance of where is the parking happened in along the streets. So it's a quite interesting thing. So that's how the public sector and the private sector work together to, 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 to solve these challenges. I think also that this is something which maybe will be applied to more issues in the future when we're talking about mobility, right? Mobility as a service, everything around that, the, the relation between bottom-up um, definers and innovators and um, the public authorities. Pablo, there is another question for you. Uh, in what year was the bicycle street you mentioned adopted uh, in law? Because you said you were kind of stuck in between the fronts. And um, when was that then? Uh, it was uh, adopted in law in 2016. In 2016. Yeah, 2016, yeah. Okay, Pablo, there's another question for you. Um, you mentioned the spoken about the demographic of, you mentioned the demographic of bikers, women and children. Can you please elaborate about biking equity, equality, uh, a common problem in the US? I do not know too much about Aarhus, but can you please share more about the socioeconomic status of common bikers? Is there a disparity between high or middle class citizens and lower income citizens in terms of biking? Yeah. If so, no. uh, yeah. a place to encourage biking for all. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, in Denmark, uh, there's not this, uh, this uh, difference in, uh, it's not the low income people using their bicycles. Actually, most of the people using, well, the super commuters are very much high income uh, people. The thing is, it's not seen as a low status to use your bicycle in, uh, in Denmark. So uh, when we do bicycle promoting, it's for everyone. Um, and that's really a great thing, I think. Uh, I once heard a uh, Gilbert from uh, this, uh, this famous planet, planet saying that if you have a city where you have women riding your bicycles, then you have a true livable city because people are safe in using their bicycles. And if you also have kids, you have the optimal city. And we have both things uh, in, in Oahu. So I think we are quite privileged and we don't see all these problems that you have in the States. I know with the uh, problem of the counted needs and, uh, and levels in, in, in society. So. Okay, Pablo, thanks for that. Um, there's another question, uh, Pablo. Uh, the commuter superhighway is a brilliant idea and the landscape along it looks very beautiful as well. I was just wondering how do you ensure the safety along the bicycle superhighways? Yeah, I think uh, it, they're referring to the social safety, uh, the, the safety of not getting mugged, uh, I presume. Um, in Denmark, we don't have problems with people or well not big problems of people uh, getting mugged so uh, normally when i take foreigners on these uh, bicycle commuters uh, super highways they say well do people use them don't they feel insecure riding a bicycle on a uh, stretch where there are no other people or cars or anything and the thing is no people just use them also 54 percent women using these uh, bicycle super highways without any problem. We have a real good economy uh, in, in Denmark, and that means we, we have a very good social net, so that means we don't have uh, many problems of uh, uh, people robbing or uh, thugging each other, so that's not an issue in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Daizong, actually I would have a question because uh, many of us are observing the development of free floating bike sharing in China and the expansion of the bike sharing companies going global. Um, many people now, they just see, as you mentioned, uh, the mountains of colorful bicycles everywhere. They see the chaos on the streets in China, but also in cities like London or Munich experienced uh, that quite badly. So how, what, 
what do we need to do to keep the positive, uh, let's say, um, dynamic, right? That it not turns into something where people then say, ah, oh, you see, we knew it from the beginning. This is such a, such a bad thing, just uh, kind of disrupting our cities. What in the cities now in China, but also uh, everywhere else where free floating bike sharing is going to, what they need to do to um, keep it in order to regulate it, but on the other hand, also not kind of uh, regulate uh, these developments to be bad. Oh, I think so many of the bicycles is being put in that kind of place. It is not normal because it's a quite kind of a internet industry. At the beginning, they have a lot of money. They want to just uh, expand the market. They want to uh, build up the bigger scale of the, the, the number of the population. So it's quite not very uh, theoretical or not a reality. So it's just a one to a uh, very bad competition during the one, one or two years. Actually, you can find even in, in, in some other countries at the beginning of some new uh, in, internet industry. So it, it's quite normal. Uh, but the, the secondly, I want to say uh, all the capital needs to get the profit. <laughs> if they put so many bicycles on the street without any prof profitable making, it's not sustainable. So maybe after Two or uh, one well, two years, very very bad competition. Some company need to thinking more about the profitable. Then they can control really control the the population of the bicycles and the, the, the and so on. And another big issue is actually this kind of uh, bike sharing company is easy. Uh, it's very easily to understand the demand. Where is the demand happen and how many demand? Because when people open the apps, they want to find the bicycles. It's a quite uh, uh, very specific information to the operators that they have one demand and need. So uh, after some of the data analysis, it easily can compare, uh, can can match the supply with the demand. So if we can use this data better and share with our city administrations, we can find a way. If they have a huge demand in that area, we have to find a place to park in to, to give the kind of supplies. Thanks, Alexa. I think this is also another good point uh, which, which touches a bit the relation also between uh, authorities, municipalities, and the private sector. So once bottom up, the, the private sector is supporting collecting the data mm -hmm. with the smart bike sharing, for example, and this is and provides this to the municipalities, to the authorities, then they can just basically understand their own cities yeah. by travel behavior yeah. better. This would potentially, as you said, also uh, lead to uh, better planning than by uh, seeing where are the bottlenecks infrastructure-wise and, and where, need, where are needs for improvement, right? Um, actually, we have another question. Pablo, uh, do you think the free-floating bike-sharing program can work in Denmark as well, where there is a high percentage of bike ownership? Yeah, well, that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, we, um, yeah, I think so. Uh, the thing is that uh, a lot of people use, um, well, intermodality. They they use the the train to get to the uh, city or to their workplace, and the thing is that they always miss a bicycle at the other end of the uh, trip. So we're going to introduce the um, the uh, duckless bike sharing system in Aarhus. Uh, we're going to put them as a last mile offer for people using uh, public transport. Um, in this way, we can avoid that people cannot take their bicycles in public transport. We just uh, introduced the light rail in, in, uh, in Aarhus, and it's not big enough for people like in Copenhagen where they can take their bicycle on the train. Uh, so they take the light rail and when they get off the light rail, the idea is to have uh, this stockless bike sharing system for people to take the, the last mile, mile transport uh, for the work. And Pablo, we see, received another question. Um, actually, you mentioned the uh, super commuters. So this goes a bit in the direction of that you kind of classify the users of the bicycle, like uh, people, they use that for short trips, maybe just to commute to work uh, within the city center, and the people, they use that for leisure reasons, or the people, they use that quite professionally for even longer, 20, 30 kilometer distances as so-called super commuters. 
So once you classify that, how actually your policies, infrastructure adaptation uh, is, is kind of adapted to this classification and different needs of these users? Could, could you talk a little bit more about that one, maybe? Yeah, well, well, the super commuter highways are a, a, a direct reflection of this because the super commuters that ride 20 kilometers, they need to get uh, to their workplace fast. So we don't want to provide them with routes where they have to stop at intersections uh, 15 or 25 times getting into the inner city. So that's one of the things that we do. We build good, fast infrastructure for the super commuters so they don't have to stop or where they have to stop, we try to give them priority at the uh, signalized intersections. We've had uh, some uh, projects uh, providing super commuters with a chip on the bicycle that gives them priority at intersections in the inner city because the thing is they spend a lot of time in the inner city waiting at the uh, signalized intersections. So this is a way to avoid this. So that's the way we try to provide uh, or, or to make it better for the super commuters. Okay, Pablo, then I think uh, we, we don't uh, have more questions here, um, so I would just again uh, thank uh, you, Pablo, and uh, thank you, Daizong, very, very much um, to give you these insights, and also to, again, thanks uh, to the uh, participants. Um, also, I would like to say sorry for a little bit inconvenience with the internet uh, connection. Um, that's the... We have, to, we have to face sometimes, and I would just like one uh, one thing to mention again. Um, Pablo, you said you uh, this. Correct me if wrong. I, I understood 10 million euro funding, um, and yeah. you said actually you were kind of struggling how to use that. And this, I, I I thought what I think is you said you used that basically for cases, for single cases, to awareness rising and promotion because you said it needs be visible for people what's actually the impact of the measures you took with these 10 million euros. I think this is something that ultimately leads to a question which all of us, I think, uh, have to deal with all of us, how to make our impact uh, visible. Because only if we can do that, it doesn't matter if maybe with 10 million, 1 million or, or just 10,000 euros, uh, I think with a small Interventions like you—you you showed us these very good cases and simple uh, actions you took and integrated them, but make them visible. Both the impact uh, and also how the acceptance rising of the population and the people for this uh, intervention that is uh, facilitated. I think this was a really, really uh, inspiring uh, point. So you showed us again also how. Uh, Bike sharing or cycling and generally, of course, comes along with challenges, opportunities, but in the end, uh, we saw that in the case of Aarhus, how um, cycling, once it's quite uh, nicely appropriate, regulated, is not just a mode of transport, it's more a kind of lifestyle. And I think, thanks for this, and again, uh, we will come up also with another webinar and we'll keep you participants up to date with that. Um, beginning of next year, we would like to wish all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year 2018. I hope to see you soon and thanks to everybody. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Thanks for a great conference. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.